Rubberneck alert! Your favorite celebrity's moneymaker might just remind you of other fantasy characters. Who were you looking at? Is it J. Jonah Jameson or Stan Lee? Stan Lee modeled the flat-topped, loud-mouthed editor of the Daily Planet after himself, his more angry self. But look how perfectly Jameson turned out. Thanks for the good news. What other iconic ex-characters were inspired by real-life celebrities? Let's go down the list. The show that's about nothing is all about the details hiding between the cracks. The cracks in the brain of Larry David's creative mind. Jason Alexander used Woody Allen as the inspiration for George Costanza, but the first table reads confused Alexander. So Alexander confided in Larry David to better understand Costanza's character. How could this character be smitten by a huge conflict that is never resolved? George wouldn't do this! David rebuked, What are you talking about? It happened to me. This is what I did. Then the other shoe dropped, as did Alexander's jaw, as he realized he's George. This episode splattered early in the first season. Possibly around episode 8, Alexander eschewed Woody Allen as his guiding light for the Costanza character and latched on to Larry David's neurotic idiosyncrasies. What would have become of George Costanza's character if he hadn't pressed the show's creator? Imagine Larry David running out of Jerry's toilet with his pants around his ankle screaming, Vandalay! Vandalay! Say Vandalay! The lyric, we are not men, we are Devo, has a deeper meaning when we consider that Rugrats' Chucky Finster is based on Devo's frontman and co-founder, Mark Mothersbaugh. Weird, right? Who'd have thunk that this irreverent and sometimes scary 1980s new wave band could increase their lasting image beyond the launch of Miss Pac-Man? Devo is still an active unit, but his contributions to children's programming brings us to the point. His kitty credits include Beekman's World, Santa Bugito, Clifford the Big Red Dog, and Rugrats. Apparently, the animators were taken by his bespeckled, frizzy-haired appearance and immortalized him as Chucky Finster. It must be weird to see yourself as an animated toddler. Bugs Bunny is known for his confidence in roguelike attitude. Nothing seems to singe his powder puff tail. Like a modern action hero. Cause you see back in Bugs' day, luminaries like Clark Gable were the envy of every strapping lad everywhere. His Tommy gun repartee was a crowd pleaser. Ah, uh, sound familiar? All we need to do is look at the 1934 film, It Happened One Night to see the hilarious similarity. That wascally wabbit, Clark Gable, playing the character of Peter Warren, mansplains to Claudette Colbert the art of hitchhiking, while scarfing down a carrot seems like a thing to do. But the similarities between Gable and Bugs is undeniable. What's up, Doc? In fact, Frizz Frilling, one of Bugs Bunny's creators, used the roadside scene to exemplify Bugs' mannerisms and character. Hmm. We wonder if Clark Gable had anything to do with Acme. We don't need a psychic to explain this one. John Belushi passed in 1982. Two years later, his blues brother Dan Aykroyd created and starred in the wildly successful Ghostbusters movie. Ivan Reitman, who voiced Slimer, remarked he was basically Bluto from Animal House, and the likeness is uncanny. Compare the cafeteria scene from Animal House to the room service cart scene in Ghostbusters, it's haunting. Since then, Aykroyd referred to the strangely lovable green blob as the ghost of John Belushi. Stranger still, Belushi was signed to play Dr. Peter Venkman before he died. And of course, Bill Murray took the role as Venkman, but indeed, Belushi's soul permeates this classic comedy. It wasn't and couldn't be any other way. But finding a way was always Belushi's trademark. Aykroyd publicly reminisced about the time Belushi wandered off the set of the Blues Brothers during the filming of the famous shopping mall car chase scene. Later, it was discovered that Belushi rang a stranger's doorbell. Do you know who I am? Stunned, the stranger just let him in. Later that night, Aykroyd found Belushi napping on the fan's sofa. That is such a slimer move. The 1977 hockey comedy Slapshot starring Paul Newman is an unexpected inspiration to the X-Men's combative member Wolverine. Dr. Hook, played by Paul D'Amato, is a goon on a rival team. D'Amato only appeared in a few scenes as Dr. Hook, but enough time to catch John Byrne's eye. 
The comic book artist revealed during an interview with Paul Sanderson from Morrow's Back, issue number four, that the mutton-chopped and googly-eyed D'Amato cinched it for his rendition of Wolverine. It may be the case that Burns imbued Wolvie with Dr. Hook's stern, confrontational persona as well. And those crazy eyes. The actor enjoyed modest success. Although Wolverine's doppelganger comes from the world of ice hockey, either character's legacy isn't a competition. But it's easy to see that Wolverine has infinite longevity. Maybe D'Amato should have strapped on adamantium skate blades? South Park is one of TV's most controversial shows, and that's because of its creators, Trey Parker and Matt Stone, who have never shied away from taboos, social or otherwise. And Eric Cartman, the grand poobah of inappropriate behavior and beliefs, is always at the front lines, raging against the machines. Parker and Stone admitted in an NPR interview that they realized Cartman's overt, bigoted tendencies wasn't by happenstance. The pernicious and perpetual eight-year-old was drawn from an equally revolutionary show and protagonist, none other than Archie Bunker, the working-class contrary character from All in the Family. All in the Family was hailed for tackling many sensitive social and racial subject matters during the 1970s. Perhaps Bunker, played by Carol O'Connor, wasn't as obtuse in his racist outbursts as Cartman, but after Trey Parker's admission, it all seems to make sense. They share similar appearances, and if Bunker wore a toque, that would cap off the similarities nicely. Cartoons have a lot of adult themes and references concealed from the prying eyes of children. I mean, they're all too engrossed in the lavish characters, infectious soundtracks, and emotional pathos of these sweeping tales. Ursula, the evil sea witch from The Little Mermaid, is a buoyant and ostentatious diva who tricks Ariel in order to steal the throne of the aquatic kingdom of Atlantica from her father. King Triton. Ursula's muse would, however, come from a very unlikely place. Baltimore, Maryland. A far cry from the Disney Studios, but if it wasn't for the film's lyricist, Howard Ashman, who also came from Baltimore, intrigued the animators with his sketches of a vampy, plump, and outrageous drag queen from his hometown, Glenn Milestead, also known as Divine. Milestead was also a neighbor of filmmaker John Waters, who appears as the foul-mouthed and snarky cross-dresser in such films as Pink Flamingos. Unfortunately, Glenn Milestead passed away before the release of The Little Mermaid, so we will never know if he ever approved of this homage. At the height of their fame and popularity, the Fab Four was a marketing dream, and in 1967, Disney approached these cute lads to take the roles of the vultures in The Jungle Book. John, Ringo, Paul, and George were to make for droll additions to this animated classic. The soundtrack would have made for fertile material, musically. The film's executive producers salivated at the prospect of the Beatles singing in the song, That's What Friends Are For. So the writers and animators set out to write the Fab Four's dulcet dialogue and fashion the birds with quintessential mop hairstyles and mimic the lads' physicality. But ultimately, the actual Beatles did not or could not sign up for the film as Ziggy, Dizzy, Buzzy, and Flaps. Ah, come off it. Things are right and dead all over. For some reason, the band's schedule had zero wiggle room. Allegedly, John Lennon hated the idea of turning into an animated bird. And the Jungle Book suffered from setbacks, but the creative team still flew with their original inclination, keeping the Liverpool boys in the picture, even though the Beatles didn't flock to it. In 1963, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby concocted two quintessential characters in the X-Men universe, Magneto and Professor X, who were embroiled in their own civil er, mutant rights battle. Magneto's desire to eradicate non-mutants was an unsurmountable bugaboo. Stan Lee and Jack Kirby supported the actual civil rights movement of the day and they decided to mold their new characters after Martin Luther King Jr. as Professor X and Malcolm X as Magneto. Respectively, these four crusaders fought for equality, as they had been subjugated for far too long, which possessed real mortal danger for Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. The two luminaries were assassinated for their beliefs, but they never abandoned peaceful protest to bring about equality. Who has done more exhilarating exploits than Tom Cruise? He's a stickler for performing his own stunts, diving off of cliffs, driving motorcycles really fast, even clinging for dear life to an airplane in Mission Impossible Rogue Nation. Yeesh. 
He's a swashbuckling movie star in the finest lineage of the tradition. In fact, he's a prince. But did you know that Back to the Future's Michael J. Fox was Disney's first reference choice in the depiction of Aladdin? Supervising animator Glenn Keane decided that Mr. Cruise would make a more apt doppelganger. Tom Cruise was a favorite actor of Keane's, and he gave the star's charming smile and appeal to Aladdin. A swift choice because Cruise always wins the day and always gets the girl. And if it ain't broken, why fix it? Aladdin marked the revival of American animation, and the film's box office earnings has earned hundreds of millions of cha-ching. Do you think that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery? Or is it merely a marketing choice to capitalize on a hot commodity? Sound off in the comments section below and subscribe to stay current on all upcoming Screen Rant videos. And flatter us with a big old like.